This program is brought to you by We are defined by our history. A collection of unique narratives describe our past, our current, and our future. Some events we wish never happened, and some moments we'll never forget. But one thing that history has taught us is that when we are united, we are strong and unconquerable. When we choose love, we've chosen justice. When we speak, our voices are heard. Today we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his sacrifices and his acts of love to make us a more perfect union. And in doing so, we'll honor his legacy by continuing to seek truth over power and making sure we're moving forward and not taking steps back. History is still being written. What story will you leave behind? The dream lives, and the march goes on. Welcome, Columbus, Georgia. Today we'll be honoring Dr. Martin Luther King's 92nd birthday. Now, usually we'd be all be able to meet together, but this year we're doing something different. We're bringing the program virtually to you, and I'll be your host, Megan O. I'm here at the Liberty Theater Culture Center, where many trailblazers perform, like My Rainey, as well as Duke Ellington, Cap Calloway, plus many other greats. And today we'll be highlighting local artists and musicians. But here's something really, really cool. We're gonna have a fireside chat with Ambassador Andrew Young. But before we begin, here's an opening prayer from Chairman Norman Hardman. Good evening and welcome to this virtual MLK Day celebration. I'm Norman Hartman, the chair of the Mayor's Commission on Unity, Diversity, and Prosperity. Let's take a moment to open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for all of the blessings that we have to be thankful for in our lives. We thank you for this day of reflection, that we focus on a great hero that has left a legacy that we continue to celebrate year after year and great, grab great wisdom and insight from to take into the future. Father, I thank you in this moment that we accept the charge to carry the ball forward to carry forward with fortitude, with wisdom and insight and great diligence. I thank you, Father, for the leaders, all of the listeners that are tuning in at this moment. I pray, Father God, that those things that have been stirring within them would come to the forefront and carry them forward. God, I pray for our clergy. I pray that you would give them great strength for the journey that lies ahead. Give them great support and stability within their membership, within their leadership, to fulfill the vision that you've given them. Thank you for our agencies and our organizations, that they will work better together and they will be stronger, depending on one another, seeing great fruits from their labor. Lord, I thank you for this city and our leadership. God, give them all the tools and resources that they need in order to lead us forward into uncharted territory to do things that we thought were impossible. We thank you for the unity of this city. We thank you for the legacy of this city. And we thank you for being in the midst of us as we pray. And it's in your name, Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. At this moment, let's welcome our mayor, Mayor Skip Henderson. Thank you, Norman. And I uh, also want to take just a quick minute to thank you for your uh, excellent leadership as chairman of the Mayor's Commission on Unity, Diversity, and Prosperity. You know, without that group's efforts and, and constant uh, work to try to make sure that equality exists for all of the residents of Columbus, this function wouldn't happen. Uh, and, and I want to invite you to sit back and enjoy something that I think you, you'll, um, you'll realize is a little out of the ordinary. 
Uh, we are really excited to have you here and taking a little time out of your day to help us celebrate the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, we started the Dream Lives um, celebration years ago. It started under uh, previous mayor, Mayor Tomlinson. My administration has kept it going, and our goal has been to make it a little more special, a little more different, a little more unique each year. Uh, last year, we introduced an art component to show some of the incredibly talented artists in our community, both young and old. Um, lots of outstanding entertainers bringing all kinds of music, and it was truly a uh, one-of-a-kind spectacle. And uh, so this year, uh, COVID uh, has forced us to improvise once again. But we're happy to do it because it gives us a new way to take a look at uh, new ways to celebrate uh, the life uh, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So what you're going to see today is going to be some of the most talented people you'll find anywhere, and you don't have to leave Columbus to find them. Uh, so you'll see some tremendous artists uh, applying their trade. And in between, we're going to have sort of a little fireside chat with one of the civil, uh, civil rights icons and a very good close friend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s, uh, Andrew Young. Uh, you know, the former mayor and ambassador, Andrew, Andrew Young, has been such a, a calming yet consistently steeled voice uh, for civil rights uh, that, that we are just so honored that he has agreed to, to participate in our uh, Dream Lives celebration. So again, thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you for helping us continue to pursue uh, the type of equality and the type of community we want to see. Because uh, I think we all have to acknowledge that Dr. King's dream has not yet been fulfilled. There's still a lot of work to do. But days like this, when we can bring together the multicultural uh, individuals living here in Columbus, Georgia, uh, show that we're not, we're not done with the fight. In 1954, I was a seminary student in Connecticut, and uh, I had just gotten married in Marion, Alabama, and I was assigned to a church in Thomasville, Georgia. And um, I had just gotten there, and there was a meeting at the AME Church in Columbus where the Primus King case ending the Democratic white primary uh, had been tried. And uh, Thurgood Marshall had been the lawyer, uh, and Primus King, I think, was the pastor. And there was a voter registration meeting. The All Citizens Voter Registration uh, Committee of Georgia. And I drove from Thomasville up to Columbus, and uh, just to be a part of the history that I thought was being made. And they asked me, would I be willing to head up the voter registration drive in Thomas and Grady County? And I had two little churches, one in Thomasville and one in Beechton. And um, so I was honored to be asked uh, but I didn't think there'd be any difficulty, but once we got the uh, announcement out, we had signs up on posts and in churches and all over town, and John Wesley Dobbs, uh, Maynard Jackson's grandfather, uh, asked me to run the voter registration drive and said he would come down and help kick it off. So one Saturday, just before he came, we were on the way back driving from Albany, and we went through Moultrie, the back road, and we hit around a curb, and it was a little town called Doe Run, Georgia. And uh, I was in the car with my wife and my three-month-old baby, and uh, Damn if we didn't see what seemed like a thousand people with sheets on and pointed hats. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, Lord, 
we got trouble because that was right outside of Thomasville. And I told my wife that it, I didn't want to run, but we go down there and I said, I want to go out and talk to him. And see, I grew up in New Orleans. And when I was four years old, the Nazi party was on the corner of my house, 50 yards from my house, and they were hiring Hitler. So I'd been dealing with white supremacists all my life. And my daddy always said that white supremacy is a sickness. And you really don't get upset at sick people and you don't, you don't have to be afraid of them. But you have to be calm and you have to be confident and you have to make sure you're 100% in the right. Uh, a little later on, he showed me a bar of ivory soap and he said, see that soap is 99 and 44 100% pure. He said, that's not good enough for you. This soap is white, you black. <laughs> you gotta be 100% on the case. And um, that was the way I was raised. So I really wasn't afraid of the Klan, but I, in trying to figure out how to deal with them, first thing I thought was what most folk would think back then. Uh, my wife was a very good shot. And I said, I'm going out and talk to him, but I want you to sit in the window and uh, point your gun at whoever I'm shooting, I'm talking to. And she said, I can't do that. I said, but you can, you're, you're a much better shot than me. She said, yeah, but I can't point a gun at a human being. I said, damn, woman, that's the Ku Klux Klan. She said, yeah, and you're a preacher. I said, so? She said, so if you ever forget that under that sheet is the heart of a child of God, you need to quit preaching. I said, oh, Lord, what kind of crazy woman did I marry? <laughs> uh, <coughs> but what it did, it made, me, it made me stop and do what my daddy said to do. Don't panic, stay cool, stay calm, and don't get mad, get smart. Think your way through. And I called one of the leaders of the community, that one of the old timers, and he suggested that I go down to Watts Hardware Store and talk to the mayor about it. And that was the way the mayor was Mayor Watt. And I talked to him about the Klan on the outskirts of town and our uh, voter registration drive starting the next day. And he picked up the phone and called Sunnyland Packing Company and Flowers Bakery. Uh, who's still there, and uh, they told, they announced on their plant microphones that we don't need any racial troubles, and they called the sheriff and told the sheriff the Klan has a right to have their march, but keep it on the courthouse square. Don't let them go into the black community, and Sunday make sure that uh, when we have our voter registration drive starting, there's nobody trying to interfere with it. That was the most valuable lesson I learned. And the lesson was, you don't count just on the mayor and the sheriff, because it takes 50%, 60% for them to change their mind. But the business community is much more sensitive. Five. 10% loss of business is a real crisis for them. So the business community is much more sensitive to racial justice or they don't want trouble. They want to make money. And um, I learned that lesson in 1954. Uh, the Klan had their meeting that night they marched around the courthouse square. We had our meeting uh, that Sunday, and I'll never forget what John Wesley Dobbs said. And he talked about the Primus King case and the Democratic white primary. Uh, but uh, he said two things that were very important right then. He said, stick with this blue-eyed boy, <laughs> but watch him. <laughs> And uh, he said, we're not trying to be separatists. 
we're trying to learn to live together as brothers and sisters. But the experience of working with ordinary people, we had a good voter registration drive. The Klan coming out made us do what we probably, sh what I learned we should have done anyway. We should first go and inform the mayor, inform the sheriff of what we're going to do. Uh, most people who disagree with us are actually afraid of us. And that was true um, in South Georgia, especially in Albany, uh, years later when I came there with Martin Luther King. Uh, but it was also true when Jimmy Carter sent me to South Africa. And I had to meet with, well, I asked to see who, who are the r worst racists you got? Who, who, who are the ones that are keeping Mandela in jail? And they said, well, you don't want to see them. They, they, they wow people. I said, no, I said, they had a problem. Uh, and so I did the same thing in South Africa in, um, in the eight, s 70s uh, that I did in Thomasville and Columbus in the early 50s. And it worked the same way. Talking with the South African uh, Minister of Defense, uh, the biggest question he had was his own fear. And he said, how long do you think we'll have before the, there's a, how long do you think it'll be before we have a bloodbath? And I said, I don't think you'll ever have a bloodbath. I said, my friends, uh, want to have a multiracial democracy. They're not trying to kill white folk. And he, he, he said, I, I, I don't believe that. How can you say that? I said, well, Gandhi formed the Indian National Congress and they had uh, went to I India and they s had a democracy established in India uh, and ended the rule of the British. And I don't think they killed a single Englishman, see. And I said, President Carter uh, sent me here because he grew up in South Georgia where the area was 80% black. And he had helped Georgia uh, get through uh, an early transition. Uh, and he offered his help to South Africa. And he said, the full strength and faith of the United States government if you want to have a multiracial democracy and learn to live together black and white in peace and prosperity, we'll be willing to help you. And that's what got Nelson Mandela out of jail and it took a while, uh, but he ended up being the president of South Africa. Uh, but it was interesting because he invited his jailer to sit with his family because the jailer had been, he said, part of his family for the 27 years he was in jail. Uh, and uh, I think it was that spirit uh, that we had uh, growing up uh, that Mandela and South Africa had that enabled us, that Jimmy Carter grew up with in South Georgia. Uh, and it's based on the Judeo-Christian faith in freedom and justice and peace. It was out of those experiences that uh, I met, uh, in fact, I was in Thomasville, where the next year I uh, went up to Talladega College uh, to a Alpha Phi Alpha Religious Emphasis Week program. And they invited Martin Luther King and me. Uh, I think they invited him. He was already famous on the cover of Time magazine. I was a little country preacher. 
but they invited us both. And I said, well, they invited him, but they invited me as a backup because they thought something might come up and he wouldn't come, he didn't come. But we both showed up and uh, that was the beginning of my working with him. Here we are at the home of the mother of blues herself, My Rainey's home. And you know, one thing that's cool about her is she's a pioneer in her own way, just like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We're gonna take it inside because Science has a musical tribute with a couple of songs from Marvin Gaye. So let's go ahead and go inside, come on. So many of you cry. Brother, 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 while wow, there's so many of you dying. Oh, we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Father, Father, there's no need to escalate. War is not the answer, only love can conquer hate. Oh, you've got to find a way to bring something out in here today. Picket lines and picket signs. Don't punish me with 
brutality Talk to me so you can see Oh, what's going on? Oh, what's going on? What's going on? Hey, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, what's going on? Oh, Mother, mother, everybody says we're wrong. But who are they to judge us? Simply because our hair is long. Hey, we've got to find a way to get some understanding. Here today, picket lines and picket signs don't punish me with brutality. Just talk to me, and you'll see all oh, what's going on. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Hey, Science did an amazing job. Don't you agree with that Marvin Gaye tribute? It's something about a Marvin Gaye tribute. His songs just really hit close to home. And for artists to be able to use their creativity to express their emotions, I think it's superb. That's exactly what Gary did with this George Floyd portrait that he made. You can feel the emotion in there. And speaking of that, that's why we're here at Gary Pound Studios. And we're about to take it to the next fireside chat with Ambassador Andrew Young. You know, in Albany, uh, when Dr. King was in jail, I had to go into the jail to visit him. Uh, that was a campaign that they said we lost. Well, we didn't get a national civil rights bill out of it, but we didn't because the Kennedys were new. And they didn't really understand the South like, say, Lyndon Johnson did later on. But uh, going in and out of that jail, uh, I realized that, well, there was a big uh, sergeant behind the desk that was about, he was about 6'5", looked like he weighed almost 300 pounds. And I walked in and I said, excuse me, sir, but I'd like to see Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy. He, he said, there's a little nigga out here that wants to see them big niggas out back there. What do I do? <laughs> see. And somebody said, send him back. So I went back and I told Dr. King what he said. He said, look, I don't care what he called you. You got to get in here and talk to me every day and sometimes twice a day. Ralph said, why didn't you jump off over the desk and slap him? <laughs> I said, because he's, you know, 300 pounds and got a stick and a gun. Uh, that's stupid. And so Martin said, well, look, I, I don't care what he calls you. You got to figure out a way to get to see me at least once a day, sometimes twice. It, it turned out to be very simple. I remember what my daddy told me as far back as kindergarten, see, about not being afraid and being friendly. And I looked at his name. And so this going back, I said, thank you very much, Sergeant Hamilton. Uh, 
and uh, he, it caught him off guard. And he said, huh? I said, oh, I said, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, maybe we can have a little time to talk a little bit. He said, oh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Well, when I went back in the, mo the next day, I called him by name, and he lifted his head and waved and spoke, and I stopped him. And I said, as big as you are, you had to play football somewhere. And he said, yeah, I was a tackle down at Valdosta State. And so I stayed there, and I talked to him about football, see, for about five minutes. And, um, but in just those five minutes, he went from looking at me as racial to looking at me as somebody who shared a common interest in football. See? Well, long story short, when I was at the United Nations, I went to make a speech up in Maine. And when I finished the speech, this tall, skinny guy uh, came up to me and said, that was a great speech. He said, uh, you've come a long way. And he said, uh, you've forgotten me, now, haven't you? I said, yeah, where did we meet? He said, the Albany Jail. Now, he trimmed down from 300 pounds to 200 pounds and had on a green Augusta jacket with white flannel pants and white buckskin shoes, looking like a New England country club pimp. <laughs> See? And I said, you're not Sergeant Hamilton from the Albany Jail. And he said, yeah, as soon as you all left, I found that they needed a security guard up here. I packed my family in a station wagon and we drove on up here and he said, it's the best move I ever made. He said, that's the reason I came out here. I came out to tell you, to thank you, uh, that uh, things have changed. People have changed, see. The world has changed. And we did it and The tragedy of it all is that the only people we have killed are each other. And we have taken out the frustrations that are on us because of racial prejudice and segregation on each other. And the anger and frustration, we get mad with each other. And uh, I used to see it down there in the country, in my little country church. You know, a man would have a bad day at the uh, bakery, uh, and uh, he'd come home and he'd be fussing with his wife about not having dinner ready, and she'd pick on the, you know, one of the oldest kids' uh, daughter and tell her to hurry up and go ahead. Your daddy's ready for you. Go ahead and set the table, you know. And she would pick on the little brother, and the little brother would go out of the back door, uh, and he'd kick the dog, and the dog would go out in the yard and run the chickens. <laughs> and it's, it, it's just a stream of frustration that we pass on to each other when all it takes is taking the time to think it through and understand it and instead of taking it out, our frustrations out on each other, be willing to forgive and try to understand and work with even the people that are causing the trouble racially. That's sort of what I did when I went to see the mayor, see, back in 1954. And when I talked, made the police uh, sar desk sergeant talked to me. I mean, I, I found something he was interested in. I didn't think of him as white or racist. I thought of him as something else. He was, and I got it right. He was a good football player, see? And every good football player loves to talk football. <laughs> in fact, Dr. King used to say that uh, 11 o'clock Sunday morning might be the most segregated hour of the week. But by one o'clock, uh, when the football game starts, everybody's brothers. 
And you cannot have a football team that's all white or all black. <laughs> it just doesn't work. But the same thing is true with a business. See, and um, any business that's successful, any city that's successful, any church, um, anything that we do, we have to do realizing that God has the whole world in his hands. And it's not our world. And we might want it to go backwards, but the world is only spinning the way the Lord wants it to spin. And it's going to be going around the sun that way till eternity. Uh, freedom is a constant struggle. And people say, well, when are you going to retire? And you can't retire from voter registration. Because uh, if you retire from voter registration while you're old, you li your Social Security is liable to get cut. <laughs> your health care is liable to get cut. Y y you lose your life if you, if you don't use your vote. As the march continues on, we're here at Tony Pettis' studio. And we're about to go ahead and highlight local musicians right here from Columbus, Georgia. We have Lloyd Buchanan featuring Garrett Lee. Time, time and time again, I wonder when will this man when will the story end? Seems like time, time is just standing still. I wonder when will this man, is, when will the story end? With seconds turn to minutes, minutes turn to hours. People in the streets are dying. Or politicians fight for power. I wonder when will this man is, when will this story end? Because time, time and time again, I wonder when will this man is, when will this story end? Seems like time, time is just standing still. I wonder when will this madness, when will this story end? With the mother against her daughter, a father against his son, a herd that grew so strong he even shot him with a gun. I wonder when will this madness, when will this story end? Because time Time and time again, I wonder when will this madness, when will the story end? Seems like time, time is just standing still. I wonder when will this madness, when will the story end? Oh, with the Wall Street against the Main Street. Against my street, too busy fighting on social media. We can barely hear our babies. I wonder when will this madness, when will the story end? Because time, time and time again, I wonder when will this madness, when will the story end? Seems like time. Time is just standing still. I wonder when will this madness, when will this story end? Oh, when will this madness, when will this story
been traveling these wide roads so long. My heart's been far from you, 10,000, 10,000 miles gone. Oh, I want to come near and give every part of me. But that's blood on my hands and my lips are unclean. In my darkness, I remember mama's words reoccur to me. Surrender to the good Lord and he'll wipe your slate clean. Take me to the river, I want to go. go. Take me to the river, I want to know. Dip me in smooth water I go in Like a man with many crimes I come up for air As my sins flow down the Jordan Oh, I want to come near And every part of me But that's blood on my hands And my lips are unclean Take me to the river, I want to go. go. Take me to the river, I want to go. I want to go, want to go, want to go, yeah, I want to know, want to know, want to know, yeah, I want to go, want to go, want to go, so, oh, take me to the river, I, Wanna go No Take me to the river I Wanna And now we have Rhea 706 with her cover of Bill Withers' Lean On Me.
me, brother. When you need a hand, we all need, we all need. I just might have a problem that you'll understand. We all need, we all need. Call on me, brother. When you need a hand, we all need. With that excellent piece from Rhea 706, she showed us how our youth are using stories from our past and how they're taking that and shaping and molding our future. We're here at the Mildred L. Terry Historic Library because it represents all of the lived experiences that blacks went through when simply denied library services in the segregated South, library services. But with all the stories that are housed inside of this library, there's one that resonates the most and it's a mural from Najee Dorsey titled, Stories Untold, Are Stories Forgotten? And Ambassador Andrew Young also said that as long as someone continues to say your name, you are never forgotten. So let's go ahead and get into another fireside chat with Ambassador Andrew Young. One of the other things that I did that was also near Columbus, uh, that same summer, I went to Warm Springs. And when I went to Warm Springs, uh, where President Roosevelt used to go for his polio, in those days, people were in iron lungs all over there. And they had to be in an iron lung to breathe because polio took their breath almost like now as ventilators. Uh, they do the same thing, they help you breathe. Uh, but. It took us almost 10 years to get a polio vaccine. And then polio changed and we had to get a new vaccine. But I started out getting shot in my arm for polio, I don't know, at least 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, then uh, 10 years later, uh, there was a new vaccine, which they didn't have to stick you. They put a drop of, uh, this vaccine on a sugar cube. Uh, and, and that was another way of giving you the same vaccine. Uh, and uh, every year, uh, I remember uh, to get a flu shot. And now they have a pneumonia shots. So I got that too. Uh, and uh, my wife made me get a shingle shot because I couldn't remember whether I'd have ever had chicken pox or not. Uh, and it was easier to take the shot than to run the risk of getting shingles because that's what old folks get. And, you know, I'm 88 years old. By the time you run this, I'll be 89. Uh, almost. Well, I'll be almost 89. And uh, we'll be celebrating Dr. King's 92nd birthday. Uh, and he used to say that freedom is a constant struggle. And as long as you live, there will be some freedoms that we will have to struggle for 
for ourselves or for others. And um, the world can't continue half slave and half free. And slavery doesn't just mean with chains on your legs or being in jail. Slavery is also something that paralyzes and conscripts your mind and limits your thinking. And um, we've got to change our thinking about police. Now that doesn't mean you don't need police. It means that, uh, well, when I became mayor, the first thing I did was integrate the police. We had already started, but we started at the top with a black chief of police and a black uh, superintendent of public safety. Uh, and, but the problem was they both had PhDs in criminology from California, and they didn't know anything about Georgia. So when one of them left, I found a good white boy that grew up in Georgia <laughs> uh, and was smart as he could be. He didn't have a PhD, but he knew the city better than any PhD. You, could, you couldn't find that in a book. And he helped us in the problems of the missing murdered children. Uh, when we had the Olympics, we couldn't just be an Atlanta Olympics. The Olympics had to take all of uh, metropolitan Atlanta, and it had to involve people in eight or 10 counties. Uh, and the fact that he was white uh, and grown up in this neighborhood and knew all these chiefs around helped us have good law enforcement. But we also realized that uh, Women use their brains, and men are more likely to use brawn. And that if you want to have a good police force, you got to have women in some decision-making capacity. So our police force was half and half black and white, but a third of it was women. Uh, and we put the women in the training. Uh, and, and, and they had a lot of leadership positions. You can't imagine what Georgia would be like if it hadn't been for Hank Aaron and Herschel Walker. They put a revolution on in this state, see? But with no money, and very little support. Martin Luther King made them possible, but he also is still with us. And they say, you were standing on the balcony when Martin Luther King was shot. What did you think? And what I thought was, damn it, you gone to heaven and have left us in hell. <laughs> we should have gone, we should go with you. They should have shot us all. They didn't, and I think he did go on to glory. And now next up, we have a musical tribute from our very own, the Dream Lives Choir.
Yeah. Listen, I want the world to know their names. Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Philando Castile. I want the world to know their names. Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and countless others is why I say that Black Lives Matter understand the statement. And if anybody think it's racist, your attention's vacant. So mentally bankrupt that you couldn't pay it if you wanted to. These my eyes, my point of view, my feet, they run with mine. And I don't know them, but I'm heartbroken. I'm just a white boy that was raised to keep his heart open. We all made in this image. Our value is intrinsic. Respect every person is our mission. Why can't people get it? See, I'm tired of these hashtags replacing lies. People get killed in the street and killers have no disguise. But we gotta stop and speak on this disaster. And I promise I'll never stop until Black Lives Matter. Let's go. March goes on, and now we have another performance from Fountain City Slam. I grow up a black girl. I grow up a black boy. Armed with dream, I am red in the arms of Martin Luther King. Watch his arms grown slack. Watch the light die out in his eyes. I find few ways to put it back. And, and they, they say the march is done. done. The dream grows weary as his eyes feast on current events. We join hands with those of paler moon shades. They wipe their hands soon after. We are still judged by the color of our skin. We, we are, are still, still killed, killed for it. I feel the slaughter of the summer and the cutting of the movement. Politicians call upon our heroes and the march. They say it has seen its fulfillment. But I hear racist rhetoric. I see those refusing to vote. I see murderers set to walk free with hands stained with black blood. And wonder if the movement will ever see autumn. And, and they, they say the march is, is done. And, and it isn't. isn't. And my black hands will stay raised. For every brother that has to stop with palms up and heart pounding. 
My hands will demand reparations. We'll take it from those who dare refuse. Whether through force of marching feet or bruise by ballot. And, and they'll, they'll say, the, the march is done. done. And next up, we have a performance from the Voices of the Valley Children's Chorus. Oh, don't we love musical performances? Next up, we have Vessel Music Group's Andrea Reese coming up now. In a little 
mountain Oh, and just like the river I've been running Ever since It's been a long, a long time coming But I know a change gonna come Oh, yes it But I'm afraid to die Cause I don't know what's up there Beyond the sky It's been a long, a long time coming But I know a change gonna come Oh, yes it will We hope you enjoyed the uh, Dream Live celebration, and um, and I want to thank you so much for spending part of your day with us as we continue to celebrate the things that make us alike as opposed to identifying the things that make us a little bit unique and a little bit different. Uh, obviously, we want to thank uh, Andrew Young for being such a huge, huge part of today's celebration. And there's so many people to thank. You saw the incredible acts we had, but there's a lot of folks behind the scenes uh, we, we want to thank the Mayor's Commission on Unity, Diversity, and Prosperity. We want to thank the committee uh, that, that pulled all of this together. And we want to thank the tech, technical folks that actually made some of us look a lot better than we are. So we're going to leave you today with, uh, again, with our thanks for being here, but also with a video that uh, kind of shows you just what an incredible community we live in. We've come a long way from the 60s and the civil unrest that existed then. As you know, we still have some major problems today. We recently asked some of our local artists to come together and remake a song that we hope will inspire all of us today. Here it is for you now. We are the world. There comes a time when we hear a certain call when the world must come together as one There are people dying Oh, when it's time to lend a hand To life The greatest gift of all We can't go on Pretending day by day That someone Somewhere can soon make a change God's great big family and the truth, you know love is all we need. We are the world, we are the children, we are the ones who make a brighter day, so let's start giving. There's a choice we're making, 
and so we all must lend a helping hand. We are the world, we are the children, we are the ones who make a brighter day, so let's start giving. There's a choice we're making, oh, we're saving our own lives. It's true, we'll make a better day.
you do not get through a single day of your life without somebody quoting Martin Luther King or without you hearing something about that civil rights movement that he led and what it's doing now. And so freedom is a constant struggle and we're going to have to keep pushing for higher ground 